All right, everybody. Today is uh, another lecture on uh, linear models for classification. This is a substantial topic and worth looking at because linear models for classification are uh, widely used. Even if you have a deep learning model, the final level of classification is going to be a linear model. Linear model, you know, drawn with the help of uh, lines and planes and things like that. So under linear models, we have uh, several subtopics. Uh, one is called discriminant functions, where we learn a lot about geometry and, uh, and we draw lines and planes and so on. So we learn a little bit about uh, analytical geometry there. That's kind of an old approach. Nowadays, we don't worry about it too much, but it gives you all the underpinnings. It's worth, still worthwhile to know about it. So we look at linear discriminant functions uh, geometry, and then follow up with the famous perceptron of uh, Buffalo origin. And so that's the topic for today. I don't think we're gonna be able to get into, uh, four. right now we are in chapter four, 4.1 4 uh, uh, is a discriminant function. So that's the topic for today. The topic for uh, uh, last uh, Wednesday was, uh, was 4.0, which was an overview of uh, classification methods. So today's- yeah. Specifically, yes. Hi, Aaron. We heard you join us. <laughs> okay. All right. If there is a lot of ambient noise, uh, I'll uh, un mute you all. But right now, you're all unmuted. Uh, unmuting is nice, so we can uh, we can have you participate, or you can send uh, chat questions, which uh, Mihir will forward to me. Okay. So I'm going to now start sharing the screen for um, 4.1 linear discriminant functions. Okay. I think some of you prefer a, a full uh, slideshow mode of this. That's what we're going to do. Okay, there we are. So today's lecture is the linear models for classification. That's a big entire chapter. Chapter four is linear models for classification, within which we are looking at discriminant. So in linear discriminant functions, we typically begin with looking at the two class problem, the geometry of two class problem. So we have you have data points from two classes. How do we separate them? using uh, lines and planes and hyperplanes. Uh, and then uh, how does one generalize it to uh, greater than two classes? That becomes the multi-class problem. And typically it's done by using multiple planes, and, right? So if you know how to figure, uh, configure uh, uh, planes between two classes, you can use uh, planes between pairs of classes or one against the rest and so on. We can. Uh, can generalize to greater than two classes. <coughs> and then we'll briefly talk about a very important concept, which is called distributed representation. A, a key element uh, of uh, our today's machine learning methods is the representation that we use is not a symbolic representation, but a distributed representation. So we use uh, uh, many, uh, many parameters to uh, specify a plane <coughs> rather than uh, a few. Uh, we'll see how that is done. And uh, how do we learn these parameters? Uh, least squares classification, uh, Fisher's linear discriminant, and the perceptron algorithm. All right, so first of all, what's a discriminant function, which is uh, an equation to a plane? Discriminant function assigns an input vector x to one of uh, k classes, classes are denoted by ck. So we are, we are stating it in terms of k classes, but eventually we'll boil down to two. We restrict attention to, uh, attention to linear discriminants. The decision surfaces are hyperplanes, and each surface is represented by the equation y of x equal to w transpose x plus w naught, where w is equal to w1 through wd is a vector transpose. So we're saying we have an input vector characterized by a set of D inputs, D for dimensionality. And, uh, and so we multiply every one of these Xs by a corresponding W. We multiply them and 
by this vector multiplication, we are indicating that it is uh, multiplying the corresponding uh, Ws in Xs. Uh, that is the scalar product of two vectors. That's how a scalar product is defined. And then there's a bias term W naught. First consider k equal to two, and then next into k greater than two. Here are a couple of uh, uh, of examples of uh, linear discriminant function with two classes and multiple classes. Uh, and with these two class case, we have the blue points and the red points. Uh, and uh, and I guess these are called positive instances here and negative instances. I guess there's two class problem with positive and negative instances. Uh, and we are trying to separate the two classes uh, by a linear discriminant function. And uh, the optimal one is this black one, sometimes referred to as a base classifier, optimal classifier. And uh, then there's a couple of variants, minor variants, which hardly seem any different from the black one in blue. And those have been obtained by using some regularization methods, which say not only should you minimize the sum of squared errors, like, you know, is there anything, I guess in this case, there are no errors at all. But uh, if there are errors, they are on the wrong side, and we want to find a plane that minimizes the sum of the squared errors for both sides. Uh, not only that, we have an extra term in the minimization expression, which is the length of the weight vector that you're going to choose. By the way, what is the weight vector is an interesting question. The weight vector is nothing but a perpendicular vector to the plane. Supposing we say this black line is your separating hyperplane. How do you specify that? We specify it by specifying the perpendicular uh, from, the, from the origin to that. It's, I shouldn't call it a perpendicular bisector. It's just a perpendicular. It's, uh, uh, the vector that is perpendicular to this line and W naught uh, specifies the length. And uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, what uh, is specified by W. So it says that length should be kept as small as possible. In this case, there is not much ambiguity here. And, uh, and so this, and this is the sum of squares of the length, this is the length of the weight vector. That's what this is. And we want to minimize that quantity also. There's a lambda term, which is a regularization weight here. And then I think I mentioned this earlier on, there are variants of this, uh, this uh, regularization term. Lasso is using only the, is the uh, there's no square term here. It's the, uh, it's the Manhattan distance or some kind of measure like that. This is what this quantity is. Uh, L1 norm, I guess. This is called the L2 norm. This is called the L1 norm. There is another interesting variant here, student t is based on some probability distributions, log of one plus w i squared. Okay, let's not worry about that. It seems like a very, very specialized method, but they're not giving any better results than the plain old without regularization, minimizing sum of squared errors. It's a linear discriminant. The only reason to mention these is the others are also linear discriminant functions, but but they are uh, positioned slightly differently or could be dramatically different depending on the data set. There are all kinds of interesting data sets nowadays. So I, I'm just envying all the opportunities you all have on all kinds of data sets available. And I think uh, Mihir has uh, given you many different data sets, even for this project one uh, that you're all playing around because they're all being made widely available to everybody. It's kind of fun to work with the uh, kind of data set you might, uh, you might enjoy playing with, right? Like here is a, uh, Linear discriminant analysis, a wine data set. So there are apparently three types of wines. I don't know how they're measuring it. Maybe sugar content or alcohol content or whatever. So we have the reds and the greens and the blues. And how can you use a two-class classifier for a three-class problem? It says, well, you could use multiple two-class classifiers. Between you draw something between the uh, blues and the greens, and you just like here, you 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 get a separating plane. And then let's say we do reds and the you know, greens and you'd have this and that's separating this one. Of course, you could also have between the uh, reds and the blues and draw something more, one more, if you do all pairwise. And uh, so you'd have to resolve uh, conflicts because, uh, for example, uh, everything on, on this side is green and on this side of this is green, so that's okay. We can resolve that this triangle region is green and this region is red. What about this one here? 
it is not uh, a, it is not green this one and uh, it is uh, uh, not red also uh, but uh, between these two uh, between, is it is it blue then is the question right and there is an ambiguity if we drew one more line it would say okay you know what do you, so there are going to be cases where you can't resolve it so but still you can use two class classifiers with uh, with multiple classes so let's again look at uh, the uh, equation y equal to w transpose x plus w naught is the equation of a, of, of a specifying a particular uh, hyperplane Here's an example. Here's a two class problem. R1 and R2 are the two classes. And uh, this red line is uh, separating the two classes by a line. Okay, in general, it's going to be a plane. And uh, so, what does this equation tell you? Y of x equal to W transpose x plus W naught is the equation to this particular straight line. And uh, when y of x, y is equal to zero, we say that the point is falling on this line. And if, uh, if, if when you plug in a value of x uh, into this for a given set of uh, w, x, and w naught, if y is greater than zero, then it, uh, the point is said to fall somewhere on the, on, the, on the R1 side of it. If it is less than zero, it falls on the R2 side of it, right? That's the interpretation. So we have, a decision boundary and we can say there is a positive side of the of the plane and 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 we have a negative side of the plane defining the two classes and uh, and uh, it defines the decision boundary and there's all kinds of little geometry here so we are saying this 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 line is y equal to zero that side is y less than zero this side is y by greater than zero this side is y less than zero and we say w this particular weight is this green vector here that is perpendicular to this. And we show this as a, as a right angle here, right? It's a 90 degree line here. And there's all kinds of interesting geometry we can, we can figure out from this. And we can say, well, if you drop a perpendicular from this X to this plane, uh, then uh, the distance, we say that is the distance of any point from this plane is uh, going, you can show that, you'll have to show that, y of x over the length of the weight vector w. So if you can, uh, if you want to ask a question, how far is this point away from the decision boundary? You know, that's an interesting question. Why would we want to know that? Is uh, we are saying, how sure are you it belongs to R1? And we can say, well, that's quite far away from the decision boundary and we're very confident that belongs to class one. Uh, so this length of this uh, of this of this particular uh, perpendicular is a useful one because that tells you how confident you are about x belonging to that. And uh, we have another thing that's being uh, shown over here is how far is this a red line from the origin? If you ask that question, it is given by minus w naught over norm of w. That is saying w naught tells you how far away this boundary is from the origin. So, so that, is, uh, that is what's being given here. W also plays a role here, but W naught, if W naught is equal to zero, this quantity is zero, which means the line is running right through the origin. Isn't that interesting? So there is a kind of interesting geometry associated. So we say that uh, it, uh, this y equal to w transpose x plus w naught defines the decision boundary y of x equal to zero. It corresponds to a d minus one dimensional hyperplane in a d dimensional input space. Ah, we should also point out that we are in a, a two dimensional plane here, x1 and x2, uh, the two dimensions, and then we are drawing this line here. So it's saying that a line is a, is a one-dimensional object, whereas uh, the uh, the the feature uh, the feature uh, space, I should say, feature space is two-dimensional. So in general, uh, the decision boundary is one-dimensional less than the uh, than the dimensionality of the feature space. So now you know all about the analytical geometry about. Uh, about lines and planes, and that's what linear discriminant functions are about. How do we choose this? So the learning point then becomes how do we find this W and how do you find this W naught? 
w w how far away it should be and what what is the angle it makes to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the bound uh, to the uh, coordinates okay all right oh, okay this slide is uh, it kind of gives you all the calculations that i already told you about so we don't need to look at it in great detail how do you show that uh, the distance is uh, minus w not plus w and that is all uh, defined over here so i leave it to you to look at it those of you who are who are excited by by geometry and figuring out how it is calculated it's kind of nice to know that so i'm not going to go over it here because going over it in class is no point for some of you um you know may may lose track of me so anyway this is how you calculate these things in geometry here okay all right now uh, distance of x to the surface okay this is again how do you calculate this part y x over w this is all the this is the calculation or proving that that's the distance okay we don't need to look at the proof uh we already came across this idea of augmented vector that says uh, if you have w transpose x plus w not by uh, defining a, an augmented vector w tilde which consists of w not and w we increase it from d dimensions and make it into d plus 1 dimensions we incorporate w not as another weight but your input feature vector is instead of x is now x tilde which has got a 1 comma x which means one of the dimensions has a fixed value 1 which corresponds to w not here so if it's going to have w not times 1 is w not w times x is what the other part is so now we can say y of x is equal to w tilde uh, transpose w. so there is no bias term here so uh, that's kind of illustrated over here that uh, if we had a point 0.2 point 3 point 4 point 5 it's augmented to 1.0 point 2 point 3 point 4 point so there's a one here so this is called an augmented vector all right now let's look at the extension to multiple classes and the two approaches are using several two class classifiers which leads to serious difficulties or uh, we can use k linear functions so that is the approach that we largely take particularly when we go to uh, soft max and so on in deep learning so multiple class yeah so, so this kind of gives you uh, one more time how we can deal with uh, three classes or more with a two class classifier which you know, we we know how to figure out uh, lines between two classes one way is to uh, do one versus the rest you, you can say this is r1 on this side and this is the rest of the classes r2 on on this side and that is the rest of the classes and you say this is r3 on this side as rest of the classes uh, which uh, would uh, define that uh, the boundaries between r1 and r3 and r3 and r4 but it leaves a region here which is unresolved it's a question mark here that it is ambiguous uh, these three planes don't tell you uh, as to whether it's r1 or r2 or r3 that's this is the one versus the rest so you what you'd have to do is uh, or uh, train your classifier for uh, each class so if you have k classes capital n k classes you would have k discriminant functions of the form we just saw y equal to w transpose x plus w not and you would use k minus 1 classifiers uh, each solve a two class problem all right so this is a uh, uh, i guess uh, one versus the rest you would need actually k classifiers right huh i should have said k classifiers class right the two class needs uh, okay <laughs> okay that's right k minus 1 a two class uh, problem needs a one one classifier you don't need two classifiers so there's one minus uh, k all right uh, one uh, versus one says uh, instead of uh, one versus the rest you can have pairwise so uh, you would say c1 versus c3 c1 versus c2 and c2 versus c3 like that right and uh, the i guess this is like uh, let's think of a, a, a of a tournament right tournament a cricket match let's say you know you have you have three teams and you got to figure out 
figure out uh, you know the matches between them you would have uh, one place two two place three and three place one and uh, you would uh, you would proclaim the uh, you know the, i guess the winner based on where you're falling here all right so in the sense if the input x uh, in the c1 versus c3 game falls here and if the input x c1 versus c2 falls here so on so you have three regions uh, nicely uh, separated out this this becomes r1 this becomes r3 but you have a middle region here again that's going to be an ambiguous region this one has k times k minus one over two binary discriminant functions because how many ways can you choose two at a time? If you have three teams playing each other, you need three choose two games, right? So that's three games you need, and uh, and, and so on. So you have uh, three classes here. You have you need two classifiers here. So anyway, that's uh, that's uh, these are the issues with uh, multiple class with two class classifiers. But there is a there is an unsatisfactoriness about it because there is an ambiguous region where you cannot say what that area. This is pure geometry. We're simply saying if a point falls here, how can you say which class it belongs to? Right? So you cannot. And um, so the way is uh, to multiple classifiers using k discriminants. One way is to have uh, a discriminant function, a k class discriminant of the form. Uh, and uh, and so you calculate the value of y and you assign a point x to class ck if yk greater than yjk. So anyhow, you're going to be doing this calculation and you compare the uh, values for each class. And that's what we're doing here of this y value. And uh, that gives you a, a, a unique decision of which one had the highest value. And uh, again, decision boundary between CK and CJ is given by this same thing we just saw. And uh, and what else can we say? Decision regions of such discriminants are always singly connected and convex. So it says <laughs> if you're going to be having uh, discriminant functions of this form for each class, what it will involve is uh, you will need uh, weights associated with each feature for class one. Similarly, weights associated with each feature for class two, weights associated for class three, and each of them will have its own bias term here. And it's saying we can show that this is going to be a convex region, which looks like this, uh, which means there are no, uh, no concavities like this one here, the non-convex region. So that's something to know that uh, you can have. So we can say, well, if you're doing multi-class problem, can't you just figure out the weights for each of these classes, um, each of these uh, features separately for each class? So it's um, some variant of what we just saw earlier. This slide is just about proving the convexity, which we'll skip, convexity of these regions proof. So, Okay, we are now going to transition briefly into number of examples and number of regions. Uh, so we just went about saying uh, that we have regions in space defined by the samples. So if we uh, need K discriminants, uh, we need order K examples. So, uh, so here we are saying that uh, for these three samples, we need uh, we need at least three samples here. These circles are the samples, and they're drawing the perpendicular bisectors between the lines joining them. <laughs> and we can say these are the these are the regions for each of these classes, right? Basically, this is a a, a kind of classifier which is uh, which is quite easy to implement called nearest neighbor classifier. If you think of what is the simplest classifier you can think of conceptually is uh, if I have a set of samples, store all your samples, don't do anything, just store all your samples. And when a new input comes in, you compare it with each of these samples and you classify it to whichever sample it is closest to. So supposing I had only three stored samples corresponding to each of these three classes, and if I take any point and measure the distance to the point closest to it, 
So that essentially draws these lines without your having to geometrically draw them. It will essentially or implicitly draw these uh, lines here. So that would be nearest neighbor classifier. But the number of uh, samples you need it would be of the order of the number of classes, right? So, um, suppose we need more regions than example, right? And uh, so, supposing we have, we have complicated uh, scenarios where the regions... I've are, got a light detector on screen as you... Oh, okay. I'm going to have to... Mute somebody here, is that right? Okay. Well, let's see. <laughs> Professor, I already did that. Oh, you did that? Okay. We got some extraneous noise here. Okay. All right. Uh, that's an interrupt. So I need to recover from the interrupt. We had a presidential debate the other day where one candidate was interrupting the other one a lot and and the other candidate was losing track of what was being said earlier on. So there is the danger of uh, of interruptions uh, making us lose our line of thinking. Okay, we're back here at, uh, at a number of examples and number of regions. Okay, so we have uh, we have a situation where is it possible to represent a complicated function efficiently? That is, we have. We have uh, many regions, you know, some one class is, is a complicated region, not just a, a simple region. And is it possible for the estimated function to generalize well for the new inputs? And answer is to both is yes. And order two to the k regions can be defined with uh, order k examples. Huh? It is possible to have uh, many, many regions defined with uh, not, uh, of that order of samples. Previously, we just said, you need as many samples uh, as the regions you desire. And we're saying we have a complicated scenario and we cannot have samples in every subclass. So uh, how can we do that? And uh, this actually turns out to be the core idea of deep learning. So, Assume that the data was generated by a composition of factors at multiple levels in a hierarchy. That's what deep learning is all about, multiple levels in a hierarchy. And uh, uh, these mild assumptions allow exponential gain in number of samples and number of regions. An example of a distributed representation is a vector of uh, n binary features. So we have uh, we have a situation that uh, uh, I hope you can see the little, I need to kind of squint myself in terms of, oh, I need to uh, increase the size, right? I think we lost the, uh, lost the full screen, right? Slide show, oh, okay. Okay, here we are, okay. Hopefully you can see that better. And, uh, so we have here three planes that uh, are defined in a distributed representation uh, that we have, you know, this is like the, the hidden layer, H, H for hidden layer. So we have this region represented by zero, one, zero, uh, and uh, this region by zero, one, one, this is zero, zero, one, this is one, zero, one, zero, one here. And this is one zero zero. This is one one zero. There is one one one. So we have. So we can uh, specify. Supposing we we take uh, the input, and we uh, have uh, some kind of uh, uh, values created at a, at a next level, and uh, those are specified by h instead of x. So we have um, several regions created here. So H1, H2, and H3 are three binary features. And uh, together, they're able to represent uh, eight features. So, so with uh, three binary uh, features, uh, we are able to specify more number. An example is a vector of n binary features. It can take two to the n configurations. Whereas in a symbolic representation, each input is associated with a single symbol 
or category. So we can have uh, we can have a distributed representation in which we can go from the input feature, which is three binary features, and then we can go into two to the power of that number of regions. So this, these the deep learning networks or neural networks, they take advantage of, of this kind of a representation rather than nearest neighbor. A nearest neighbor classifier would need uh, as many samples as the number of regions you need, whereas here we have uh, more regions than than that. Okay, anyway, those are all very general statements to see what is really the difference between a nearest neighbor classifier and a neural network classifier, what is happening conceptually, and that's what I was trying to address there. Okay, so let us uh, uh, go forward. We talked about uh, what is uh, the equation to a straight line or equation to a plane. And uh, and then we went on to uh, talk about uh, two class and multi class. And now let's talk about how does one learn the parameters of linear discriminant functions. And there are three different methods we'll talk about least squares, Fisher linear discriminant, and perceptrons. Okay. So least squares classification is, uh, we've kind of done this before, analogous to a regression. So, okay, actually a closed form solution exists for least squares uh, uh, here as well. So uh, we have each class is represented by an equation of this form, the sub K, this K here corresponds to the class. So there are, each class has its own linear model. And, uh, we uh, create an augmented vector like we talked about and grouping y case into a k plus one vector which is uh, uh, there are several y's now right so it all becomes a particular uh, matrix w and a new input vector x is assigned to class for which uh, yk uh, w transpose k is largest and uh, how do we determine this w is by minimizing squared error so how is that set up so parameters using least square, the training data is of this form, xn, tn. Tn is a column vector of k dimensions using one of k form, all right? So we are using one of k representation. So uh, we are saying, although let's say it's a 10 class problem, then we would have uh, uh, a vector of size 10 whose, uh, who, whose bits are all zero except for one of them corresponding to the class. And we define uh, a matrix uh, capital T, n throw is the vector <coughs> Tn, and then uh, x is the n throw for which. So we are arranging this. Uh, this is a n uh, times t plus one design matrix. Okay, we've seen design matrix before. So this is a design matrix, which is this capital X. <coughs> and the sum of squared error function then is written as one half trace of x w minus t transpose x w minus t. So it's possible to write the uh, sum of square errors given the design matrix, even for a classification problem in this way. And uh, minimizing the sum of squared error for, enough. it's all in, in a matrix space, this is a sum of squared error function. And we take a derivative with respect to w, and set it equal to zero. And the discriminant function after rearranging is y of x equal to w transpose x. There is a there is a inverse over here, and okay, that that quantity is the Moore Penrose inverse here. Moore Penrose inverse. So w is equal to x inverse t, where x uh, x dagger there's a dagger symbol here. X dagger is a pseudo inverse of the matrix x. So. The exact closed form solution for W using which we can classify is maximum, uh, for which by K is maximum. But this solution has several limitations. Uh, if I have two classes, the blues and the reds, and we use least squares, it will find it nicely here. The magenta is, a, is the least squares. And we've seen logistic regression before. It's actually more robust. Here is almost the same. The green is almost the same as the purple or the magenta. But if the data set had this peculiarity that you have these blues here and there is some more blues here and the reds here and ask you to apply least squares using uh, the method we just talked about, uh, uh, using uh, the pseudo inverse and so on, using the design matrix. This is uh, uh, 
the least squares method is going to uh, skew this line a lot and actually make more mistakes in the blue because this this blue is pulling it towards it uh, whereas the logistic regression is doing a nice clean job here saying it's uh, not being not being changed nicely all right so there is an argument why logistic regression is a good two class classifier and uh, why not this idea called least squares so least squares is also a method uh, sum of squared errors penalizes predictions that are too correct or long way from the decision boundary. So although this is on the right side of the decision boundary, it is too far away from the decision boundary. It's penalizing it because you're using squared error, sum of squared error. Uh, so disadvantage of least squares, uh, three classes in two dimensional space. Uh, here is a three class problem and you're using uh, the method uh, of using uh, least squares. So the two class problem and the three class problem. And then we are using again a logistic regression, which also draws a straight line. And uh, we can use that to partition the space. And uh, this seems to give a nicer solution, logistic regression compared to least squares. So, so there is logistic regression. Logistic, logistic regression, you've got to keep in mind, it's a probabilistic classifier, which comes up a little bit more when we talk about discriminative methods. Whereas least squares is not a probabilistic method. It's a pure geometry-based method, and which is why it runs into some of these kinds of issues. So, so in principle, uh, you say, well, I got a classification problem. Can I simply use... Uh, uh, least squares method, yes, you can, and your results uh, may not be uh, as good as you would get with logistic regression, which happens to be a discriminative, probabilistic discriminative classifier. That's what it is. That sigmoid function we use with logistic regression assigns a probability to the point. Okay, this uh, next method of, uh, of discriminant. Uh, a method of classification is the Fisher linear discriminant, uh, which uh, says, supposing you have these points, blue points and red points here, it says uh, to classify these points, project all these points onto some line. This is a straight line here, it's going across. We are uh, dropping perpendiculars from each of the blue points and red points onto that line. You see that uh, the, the centers of the two clusters are these two axes. There's a line joining these two, and we are dropping perpendiculars from them to here. And then we see that uh, it's a one-dimensional plane, and so we got all this. Is a, this is a histogram of the blues. This is a histogram of the reds, which is how frequently that value is occurring. And it becomes a one uh, one uh, feature classifier. So it says, "I give you one value. Tell me which class it belongs to." And we can just draw a line which minimizes the error between the two classes by moving it around. Says, so, okay, this line seems to be minimizing the uh, error. That's how often a red is on the blue side and how often a blue is on the red side. And uh, we would say there is a, there is a, a method of classification. Very simple. Simply take your multidimensional data, project them onto some cleverly chosen uh, line. And you've got a one-dimensional problem, which can be solved very easily. So the problem of Fisher linear discriminant is, how do you figure out what this line is? And R.A. Fisher, one of the more famous statisticians, one of the earliest statisticians who defined a lot of things in statistics, uh, he came up with this uh, linear discriminant method, and it's been named after him. And we want to find, uh, what kind of line should this be? If we had chosen the line to be, let's say, orthogonal this way, all the reds and the blues will project on each other and they will not get good separation. So we have to move this line around all over to figure out what direction will separate the two classes the best. So that brings in issues of uh, knowing the scatter of the points. Uh, some of those have to be measured and uh, knowing what is the overlap between the points when you project it. So these all have to come into play. So Fisher said, uh, let us maximize the mean separation 
So uh, we we want in the two class problem n one points in class c one and n two points in class two, and we have a mean for each of the two classes in the multidimensional space. M one is the sum of all the points that belong to S one c one, and M two is the uh, average of all the points that belong to class c two. And we choose uh, the weight vector w to best separate class means. So uh, we are actually going to be making a projection by using a weight vector w. And we say we want to maximize uh, m2 minus m1. All right, so uh, we want to separate them as well as possible in the projection space where mk is equal to w transpose mk. So the projected point is given by this. W transpose MK. And we say we want to maximize the separation between the two points, which is nothing but W transpose M2 minus M1, right? So, uh, so this is a method he came up with saying, uh, I would like to separate the means of the classes. Uh, and this can be made arbitrarily large by increasing W. So it is uh, unconstrained to, to make it very large then this maximization keeps on getting better and better. We don't want that. We introduce a Lagrange multiplier to enforce W to have unit length. So we're saying we had an additional term to it. That is a regularization term. We add that. There's still a problem with this approach and Fisher proposed a solution. So you could say, well, can't you just add a regularization and be done with it? And uh, Fisher also said, let us minimize the variance so uh, means are well separated, but the classes. Are, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you have a question, you can type it in, uh, and uh, Mihir will bring it to my attention. Okay. All right. So not only do we want uh, the uh, means uh, to be well separated, but we want their uh, variance to be as small as possible. Right. So maximizing the function to separate projected classes also gives small variance within each class. See here, the variance is high. The blues are spread around, reds are spread around. If we had chosen the different line here, uh, the variance of these blues and reds uh, hopefully are smaller. And we can say this line is better than the, or this line over here. And maybe this is a solution. So find the line such that the classes are well separated and then we can just draw, a, draw it. We just need to choose a point and say greater than that point is red and less than that point is blue. So this is what Fisher linear discriminant does. The, so it becomes an optimization problem again and uh, we have to bring in these multiple criteria and, and Fisher defined J of W, the weight vector W has to satisfy something M2 minus M1 squared. That is the difference between the means and the numerator. And the denominator is the sum of the two variances of the two points that can be rewritten in this form and uh, blah, blah. We go through here and he says, well, the weight vector W is the inverse of what's called the scatter matrix. All right, scatter matrix is a composed. The SW is the within class covariance matrix. The SB is the between class covariance matrix. So he says, that you need to first compute the covariance matrix of the data points, SW, defined like this. So you compute the covariance matrix of all the data points, and then you uh, take the inversion of that, and that's going to give you the Fisher linear discriminant. Okay, so, all right, so we looked at least squares. Earlier on, we looked at logistic regression. Now we looked at, uh, uh, looked at Fisher linear discriminant, and how does this relate to, to least squares? Least squares is goal of making model predictions as close as possible to target values. And Fisher requires uh, maximum class separation. And for two class problem, Fisher is a special case of least squares. So there is some relationship here, but for the multi-class it becomes different. So it can be generalized for multiple classes. Okay, so that's the second method. Actually, these are the kind of uh, popular methods. So why are we learning all this is, uh, you know, what would be the obvious way of doing it would be the least squares. Uh, logistic regression is it's not so obvious, but it's, it's a good method, more, more robust, we say. 
Robust means small changes in the data doesn't change a classifier a lot. And then we got this Fisher linear discriminant, which is quite appealing that uh, whatever data you give me, I just boil down to a straight line and say, here are some points, here are some points along a line, and I, I just need to give you a point in between the two. The greater than, less than would be enough. So these are all, uh, and uh, I've had students in the past, you know, we were doing a, a postal system many years ago, and we needed to figure out whether the address on the envelope was, uh, was handwritten or was it typed. And I had a student uh, who implemented Fisher linear discriminant for that problem. He made some projections of the data points to the left, to the, uh, to the bottom, and, and he used those features and he used the Fisher linear discriminant. And it worked pretty well. So there is a role for these methods. They're, all, they're kind of the absolute simplest methods, uh, not based on any uh, complicated uh, idea of probability distributions of the data, but we do need things like scatter matrix and so on from the data set, but it can be done nicely. Okay, now we go to this famous perceptor on algorithm, the third method of the day. And uh, it's also a linear discriminant function. It occupies an important place in the history of machine learning. It corresponds to a two-class model in which input vector x is first transformed to give a feature vector f of x, then use it to construct a generalized linear model y of x equal to f, f of w transpose f of x. You've seen this before that uh, the way uh, regression and classification are different. Linear regression, we do simply w transpose f of x. In uh, classification, we, we have a function that operates on it, a nonlinear function like sigmoid. Uh, in the case of perceptron, we, it's not a sigmoid, that f of a is equal to plus one if a greater than or equal to zero, a is what it's argument, that is w transpose phi of x, and is minus one. The vector phi of x uh, includes a bias component, that's what we're doing here. So perceptron, is saying plus one or minus one, whereas, uh, whereas the sigmoid is saying it's a value between zero and one. It could be values like 0 0.5, 0 0.7, or 0 0.1, and so on. This one is saying it's just plus one or minus one. It is discrete value. So this perceptron uh, uh, functional diagram is uh, written like this. And uh, this shows it in the form of a kind of like a neural network we have a bias unit, which is set to value one, phi naught of x equal to one. Phi one of x, this is shown as a 45 degree line. So it is simply the value that's being input, the value that's being input, the value that's being input. So a d-dimensional input, which are the values coming in. The fees here are taken to be just the value itself, right? So it's nothing fancy here. And, uh, we have w naught to w d, and this output is, is is step function minus one to plus one, nonlinear activation function. That's what all these equations are saying here. So perceptron is defined like this, and uh, it uses a target coding. In earlier discussion, we had focused on t belongs to zero to one, which is appropriate for probabilistic models. For uh, So in probabilistic models, logistic regression, we uh, use the target value as zero or one. Here we are saying minus one or plus one. For perceptrons, it is more convenient to use target values, plus one for one and minus one for two. And uh, so here again, the uh, perceptron criterion, so we need a loss function here, right, called criterion here, is motivated by error function minimization and a natural choice is the number of misclassifications efw so we can say well you know can you count how many how many of them did you get right and how many did you get wrong and this error function is a piecewise constant function of w with discontinuities unlike regression and uh, in regression of course we are using uh, sum of squares and it's a continuous function uh, here you are counting how many did you get right and how many did you get wrong and uh, methods based on changing w using gradient cannot be applied. Gradient is zero almost everywhere. So it uses uh, perceptron criterion. And the perceptron criterion is seek w such that, 
For Xn belonging to C1, we have W transpose is greater than or equal to zero. For Xn belonging to C2, we'll have X is less than zero and using plus one minus one for T follows that all of the inputs need to satisfy this quantity. Uh, we only have one, uh, one inequality by having the plus one minus one, that's the advantage we get. So perceptron criterion associates zero error with any input, uh, zero with a correctly classified. And for each misclassified sample, it tries to minimize this quantity. So we can say the error function is a W transpose phi n Tn. This Tn is minus one or plus one. So the error function is stated in this way, which is a fairly obvious way. And uh, contribution of a mis misclassified sample is a linear function of W in the region W space where it is misclassified. And zero where it's correctly classified. So the total error function is piecewise linear. And uh, this diagram shows uh, uh, this perceptron error function, uh, EP, I suppose, yeah. Uh, and uh, it is showing EP of the perceptron criterion piecewise linear function here. And it uh, shows it against a squared error with margin, just squared error. Margin means you have some kind of a gap in between the, uh, between the boundary, boundary and the closest samples. And this is a summer squared error. So here EW, and it is kind of uh, figuratively showing what the solution, they all are fairly close solution regions in this W1, W2 space. So the space is W1 and W2, and we are plotting EW, what is the shape of this EW function? Summer squared errors are EP, perceptron of W or EQ, which is the squared error, the squared error with margin and so on. So the perceptron algorithm is uh, again, uh, stochastic gradient descent can be applied to this and change in weight uh, is given by WT plus one is equal to W2 minus eta, derivative EP of WT and that has this form. And the algorithm is to cycle through training patterns. Interestingly, the perceptron algorithm looks so much like uh, the uh, learning algorithm for uh, logistic regression. It also looks similar to neural network. It also looks similar to deep learning. And when was this invented? Perceptron algorithm. It was invented about 75 years ago. And where was it invented? It was invented in Buffalo, where they built the perceptron at Calspan, which is opposite the airport. So machine learning has not changed a lot in all these 75 years, the basic learning algorithm is uh, stochastic gradient descent. And the only thing is they, uh, we went away from this discrete uh, measurement of uh, the uh, discrete valued loss function to a continuous valued function. And uh, these diagrams are kind of interesting to look at. Just uh, what's happening with this perceptron? Perceptron says start with any separating plane, which is this the black line here. And then there are blue points and red points here. And it says, uh, if you have misclassified samples, go and uh, change this plane a bit. So, so it is, uh, it is trying to get, I guess, I suppose all the reds on this side and all the blues on this side is what it's trying to do. And by observing a misclassified sample, like this blue is on the, on the wrong side, it straightens it out by moving it. That's what gradient descent is doing for you. By you're changing the value of W, which is just nothing but the perpendicular to, the, to this line is being changed and you're changing that W. And that change to W is this one now. And uh, I guess they're drawing the perpendicular to each of this uh, here, right? And uh, so that is, uh, you know, from the mid, from the, from its uh, center, that's what they're doing here, and that's being changed. So it's being moved over here, and then you are looking at a red sample, I suppose. You're moving it, so you're kind of going back and forth. Black arrow is the initial parameter vector w. Black line is the decision boundary. Arrow points to a red class. Uh, circled uh, green point in. Uh, green is misclassified, this is a misclassified. 
which is added to the current W. Okay, so it was not this point, it was this one. It is added to the W and that is what moves it towards in that direction. This is the one that went wrong. We move it towards that direction. And again, uh, we see here, uh, this is uh, again uh, a point uh, which is misclassified. So we want to move it again. It moves it in this manner, which kind of gets it all right here. So if the points are linearly separable, this method actually works perfectly. So this is showing a picture of uh, perceptron training uh, in weight space. So this is the uh, perceptron error criterion, uh, the loss function. And uh, our goal is to end up at where the loss function is smallest, which is this point in the middle. And, uh, and so we, uh, we kind of um, proceed in, in a way that uh, it keeps changing. I guess uh, maybe the the uh, solution is is over here at the other point. Okay, so it's maybe this point we are heading towards. So we are kind of zigzagging to find the find the solution, uh, and uh, so that is uh, this is the idea of the perceptron training, right? So perceptron convergence. But first, what does the perceptron do? Samples y one, y two, three considered cyclically. Misclassified samples are marked. You present them y one, y one is is wrong, and then uh, you present uh, y two, and y three is wrong, y one is wrong, and y one, so on. Uh, and so we have uh, we have we are cycling through the sample y one, y two, y three, y one, y two, y three, y one, y two. So we, each time we are we are changing it by adding that sample and the, the and the way we are changing the weights is you start with arbitrary weights and then a at k plus one is a of k plus y k whichever sample was misclassified simply add it to that that's very peculiar so this is the uh, learning algorithm initialize a k is set to zero do k k plus one mod n if y k misclassified then a gets a plus y k simply take your misclassified uh, vector add it to the weight vector that's what the equation that we saw earlier on comes out to be as so. And uh, now there are some theorems that say perceptron convergence theorem. What is this? It says uh, if training samples are linearly separable, then the sequence of weight vectors given by the fixed increment error correction algorithm will terminate in a solution vector. Wow. It is saying if you have a set of samples that are that can be separated perfectly by a straight line or a plane, this simple algorithm which says take your arbitrary weight vector, if a sample is misclassified, add the misclassified sample to the previous weight vector, uh, then present the next sample. If it is okay, don't do anything. If it is not okay, add that one. So on and so on. And uh, and of course, you are labeling these samples as plus one, minus one. Uh, that's how it's working. That's also playing a role here. So add and subtract is happening there. And, uh, and so this algorithm uh, works beautifully and, and that's what the perceptron does. And so the proof and all is given here. It's, it's not trivial, but it's not that complicated. So this is the proof, proof of all of this perceptron, all right? This is uh, the history of perceptrons. This is the person called Frank Rosenblatt. He invented this perceptron at Calspan, Buffalo, New York. Frank Rosenblatt. Here he published a report, the perceptron, a perceiving and recognizing automaton. Report 85461, 1957, how long ago, 43. 63 years ago, he invented this perceptron. And where did he invent it? At Cornell Aeronautical Laboratories, now known as Kelspan. And that is the central algorithm. And today's methods in all of AI and so on, they talk about multi-layer perceptron, which is nothing but deep learning, which is the basis of all the AI that you see in the world around us. This is where it began. These are a couple of famous AI guys, Minsky and Peppert, who wrote a book titled Perceptrons, 1969. They dedicated the book to Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt died at the age of 45. He was a young man when, you know, when, he, when he died. It already, in, and look at all the wires in front of him. The perceptron involved a, a hardwired machine. And today that, uh, that, uh, that machine that he built is in the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. If you wanna look at the 
perceptron. No, this is some more detail here on the perceptron. This is what the perceptron look like. All these wires, which uh, which involve all the weights. Input is coming in, and these are all the weights that are being uh, being uh, multiplied by, and they're all being added by sum and a threshold. Wow, that's exactly what a neural network does. And uh, this was his, his idea. And uh, he, how did he learn what the weight should be? He learned it uh, by using the algorithm we just talked about. He programmed it and he got the answers. And uh, and then the hardware was, uh, the hardware simply had some wires coming in and he would set the resistances for the weights. And uh, look at this, these are all diagrams for resistance, W1, W2, WP. This is a symbol for electrical resistance. So this is how he invented it. And what was he trying to classify? He was trying to classify a character, printed A, B, C. These are all photos taken in CalSpan. And uh, they're all wearing suit and ties in those days, uh, engineers here. And uh, so this is the rack of the weights that he used, rack of adaptive weights. And patch board to allow different configurations of input features phi. All right, it's called the Mark I Perceptron. It is now in the Smithsonian. Well, okay, uh, was that the end of machine learning then disadvantage of perceptron? Does not converge if classes are not linearly separable. It will keep on continuing if they're not separable. It does not provide a probabilistic output and not readily generalized to create complete classes. So that's why we don't use perceptron that much. Okay, so uh, we will stop at that point and uh, are there any, I kind of went through all of these slides and uh, feel free to feel free to ask questions okay somebody is have a political slogan here george washington for president <laughs> okay all right um all right any any questions you can type in into chat all right uh, mihir you have a quiz for uh, today right yes professor yeah today's uh, quiz covers uh, last week's lecture okay monday and wednesday okay all right and hopefully uh, it's not too bad and too hard and uh, mihir works hard on making them not making them hard he, he works hard on making the questions so enjoy okay if you have any questions uh, you know send me email or something yeah so mihir you want to take over do i need to make you host no professor this is fine this is fine okay all right So, first 